it's great to meet you. Uh, as I say, I've seen the film. I really love what you did with it. Um, I hadn't seen the original until about two days before I saw your version. Um, and one of the things that I really love about your version is it's just so different. And you've really put your own spin on it. Um, you've taken the essence of the original, but it's like a completely different film. So tell me, um, what was that like to base the film on Cronenberg? And how did you get to the end result that you've got? This is Sylvia. Well, when we first got the project, there was an original script that uh, actually missed the mark with Mr. Cronenberg. And uh, he said this wasn't Cronenbergian, so they actually Googled Cronenberg and our names popped up. <laughs> so after our interview, uh, they were like, can you, ex they told us the backstory, and they're like, can you explain what Cronenberg is? And we just went off, and they're like, okay, we're going to handle the money, and you ladies can handle the creative, which I was like, which as a director, you're like, oh, well, that's the only way to tackle a Cronenberg movie, possibly. And Jen, being so wonderful, said, I'm going to give you something between commercial and Cronenberg, but you're very lucky, because if we were making a David Lynch movie, I couldn't even tell you what this was about. This is Jen. I'd say one of the main differences between us and David is David doesn't believe in an afterlife. He's very scientifically minded, and we're very spiritually minded. And also, he is a heterosexual male, and we are pansexual females. So as much as I love uh, women, I also love women being in power. And so the film is very much through the female gaze. There aren't moments where you feel that Rose has lost her power. And that was a huge thing that I wanted to change from the original. Not that Rose was in uh, bad light in the original. She just seemed more to be a victim of her circumstances rather than <clears throat> actually an active member of her situation environment and kind of steering her life. In the film, you'll notice anytime Rose makes a decision on her own, things work out just fine. But when Rose lets someone else poke and prod her and convince her otherwise against her gut, things don't go so well, which is very true to the reality. I wanted to make it a more female version, and I thought it was really fun to set it in the fashion world because those that don't work in the fashion world might think it's a very effeminate, very delicate, very precious kind of career path but it's one of the most cutthroat businesses in the world. <laughs> this is Sylvia, and we had to figure out what the original Rabbit was about because he anticipated stem cell research before that was even something. Because <laughs> I think David's from the future, he just hasn't let any of us know. He's just here to send a message to all of us. So uh, after studying transhumanism for weeks, I figured out exactly what he was talking about, and he was anticipating things that are happening right now. Like, if you look at Japan and China, they're hybriding humans with rats and, like, sheep, and we're like, okay, that's fine, until you get, like, you know, a sheep lung that doesn't really work as well as a human lung, because you're not rich enough to afford the best stuff. So, it was fun to put all of those elements together, but I think that's why it is such a cacophony of so many ideas, because it's like, it's here, it's here, it's here, and then of course, uh, in the original, everyone was so uh, excited that Marilyn Chambers was the lead star. They didn't even think that he had put pornographic imagery in the movie, and he did because there was literally a butthole and there's a finger poking it, and that was the whole screen. Everyone was like, that's where the uh, tentacle comes from, but a more educated mind is like, what a clever guy. Everyone's saying porn star, porn star, but nobody's thinking pornographic imagery, which is very geeker-esque. We did one of those that is very feminine. I don't know if you caught it, but... Um, I remember seeing that, and even the prosthetic artists were like, oh my god, you can't do that. I'm like, it's a rose coming out of a rose. She's rose, it's rose. This is Jen. Well, we traditionally don't really like remakes because so many of them are just cash grabs, and I consider myself a horror fan, and the, we are the fan directors. So when our people are taken advantage of for a box office opening weekend, and then the, fa the film is just shit, and it's after a great film. It's just so insulting. I actually, Rabbit isn't even our favorite Cronenberg film because all of his films are so great. I mean, Dead Ringers is my favorite. I was horrified to think of what would happen if somebody who didn't love David and who didn't appreciate or understand his work tackled a remake because then there might be, heaven forbid, people who don't know who David Cronenberg is and they might watch a bad version of Rabbit and be like, oh, he must be a bit shit. Well, that's one of the things, isn't it? I think with remakes, because when I went into it, I was thinking, is this going to be like a shot for shot remake? Is this going to be, because there's so many of those. Oh, yeah. yeah. And that's why I was so relieved in the first five minutes. I was like, this is not that kind of remake. And I'm so pleased. I mean, just to pick up on the character of Rose, it's one of the things that I picked up on is I really loved the original, but I felt like she got no character development. Yeah. And like you say, she felt more like a victim of her circumstances. Mm -hmm. What I loved about your take on Rose is that as her career's 
taking off finally her life is kind of falling apart yeah. um, but as you say she's very much kind of in control of the whole situation trying to marry it together I mean how important was it for you to actually make her into a fully fleshed female character that actually had a life and has a career and is successful? This is Jen. It was the most important thing. Uh, she didn't have a career in the first one. She didn't even have a last name in the original one. And she was really an accessory to her boyfriend, Hart. And she starts in a car accident immediately. So there is no characterization. You're just kind of catching up and she's already in this situation. Even one of the notes uh, we got from Telefilm was, can you make her suffer more? And I said, oh, okay. I'm just anything to make the Canadian government happy. Uh, like American Mary was really an analogy for our struggles in the film industry back at that point seven years ago this film was really an analogy for our current struggles in the film industry where I learned that you shouldn't kill yourself for your career and there are a lot of people who do and I think a lot of women do because for whatever reason we aren't as established in different careers or we're not as recognized in different careers we're certainly not paid equal in many careers I mean I still get the two for one one budget with us. I wonder when they hire the Cohen brothers, if they just hire Joel and then say, so Ethan's going to show up for free on Monday, right? <laughs> this is Sylvia. Yeah, I heard that's the deal with the Wachowskis too. They do both show up. <laughs> I actually think they can only afford one now. <laughs> Sylvia, but it was so important that Rose was the star of the film in every way possible. And we listened to all of David Kant's commentaries, and there's moments where um, he didn't get to put what he wanted in the film, so we listened to him. We're like, oh, that's why it happened. Like the whole thing with the tentacle, that was because her uh, intestine was refiguring itself and moving to another orifice so it could feed. And I was like, oh, that's so cool, because it was originally almost called Mosquito because it was about a feeding tube kind of a, vamp a biological vampire. And then it was almost called Rage. And I was like, oh, that's really interesting. What if we take Rose and start her as like, Peter Parker and Spider-Man to literally exact same opening and we were and there's a lot of similarities to that and I was like that's really funny but what if we take that first image and every movie of ours always ends on the face of our lead character having totally changed and we're like let's make her face something you really remember at the beginning and then when you see her face at the end you're like whoa that's, that's a big min hour, 45 minutes. That's a lot that's just happened to that girl. This is Jen. I really think that everyone's work and their art is an expression of themselves. In her original uh, film, American Mary, there's this exchange between Dr. Grant and Mary where he says, if the work is good, everything else is excusable. And she says, oh, I just thought the work is an extension of the self, which is how I feel. You really get to know who Rose is through her work as well. You see that she's not really anything special at the beginning because she doesn't recognize herself to be anything special if she was if she had any idea how highly Gunter thought of her I mean the first scene I love because she thinks he's making fun of her he's making fun of everyone except her he's having kind of a little in joke with her of they laugh when I laugh they shut up when I say you get it you get it <laughs> but she's so in her head she doesn't realize that his, her mentor has singled her out because he loves her the most he thinks she's the best this is Sylvia and she's so in her own mind he has a scar on his face she has scars on her face they're even dressed the same in the first scene and he's just like beaming with her and she doesn't she doesn't get it because she's so inside her head and so many of us are like that we're like and even uh, later on I mean she becomes gorgeous but she's so upset still but nobody says anything because they're like oh well look how hot she is right now she must be fine even uh, Brad's character everyone's like well he's so handsome he's fine Chelsea when you first meet her she's hot so she must be a fish and then as you go through and you learn them who these people are you're like oh it's more than surface level I guess you actually have to look at actions and see what these people are doing. Dr. Burroughs is one of my favorite characters because all he does is gaslight her through the whole thing. There's a scene where he, all he does is say, dreams, 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 and she's like, my, these nightmares, and he's like, hallucinations, and she's like, yeah, and it's like, there's even a point when he's looking inside her mouth and helping with the transformation, but she's like touching her nose, being like, my nose is pretty now, and that's, that's it's it's a warning, it's a tragedy. There's, there's red lights everywhere. As a matter of fact, every time you see the color red, something horrible is about to happen to Rose until it gets redder and redder and then she's trapped.
But it's such a timely thing to pick up on, isn't it? I mean, when we live in a world with social media where everyone's valued on how many likes they've had this weekend, yeah. and like you say, if people are attractive or good looking, you just assume their life must be easy. Yeah. It must be absolutely fine. And it's just so bizarre and so random. This is Sylvia. It's so sad, too. It's so lonely. Like, um, Chelsea's storyline, nobody ever really looks at her because it's Rose's story, but when Rose, Ch Chelsea picks Rose up, she's in the same outfit the next morning. Rose has slept, Chelsea's in the same outfit. She's doing blow with the girls in the first scene. When Gunter tells her she's got a photo shoot, only one drink, she's pounding booze at the bar. Even at the very end, I mean, she doesn't feel close enough to tell Rose anything because she's, she's a self-sacrificing friend. All of those characters are very real people. I mean, we base Rose and uh, Chelsea off Jennifer and me, Mary and Beatrice is off Jennifer and me. I'm a winter, Jennifer is a summer, thank God, otherwise no one could watch our fucking movies. <laughs> this is Jen, it's so funny how much beauty excuses. <clears throat> Brad, is his last name might as well be Bateman, like Patrick Bateman, he's a serial killer, he's a sociopath, but you look at him and you're like, oh well, he's hot. And it, you never, she never cares beyond he's hot and he's talking to me. Does she know much about him? Even when he's trying, on his date scene, we made it so specific that he's so dismissive of the things that are so important to her. And then he kisses her and then he tries to get her drunk when she's not into it. And this also, is Sylvia, after, but that's, that's modern romance because, I mean, because of social media and because of all this technology that connects us, we're so disconnected. We yeah. don't even know how to talk to each other anymore. This is Jen. And also, after the accident, Rose isn't better. Rose, nothing has fixed except her skin. Like, she's only skin deep healed. Even Brian comes and sees her and he says, oh, it's like the accident never happened. She's like, no, it's not like it's never happened. And she went from <clears throat> a childhood car accident re-traumatized in another car accident. She never gets therapy, she never talks about it. The very next day after she comes home, Chelsea just leaves her like, well, you're pretty now, so there you go. This That's is, done. This is Sylvia, and like Chelsea's her adopted sister, and she's like, I know you don't open up. They're so cold to each other at the beginning. You're like, but that's also sisters sometimes. You're like, do you even know each other? That's like, yeah, it's This wild. is Jen, also the foster sister thing. That's so horrible. I hate it when someone says, well, you're not my real sister, you're not my real dad. Just because you're a biological donor doesn't mean that you're a parent. It yeah. takes a lot more to be a parent than just not put a condom on. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> but something else I wanted to pick up on is I followed Laura's career right back through to Smallville. Wow. Um, in this film, you get a performance out of her like I have never seen. I have never seen her perform this well. Um, I mean, what was she like to work with? And all that makeup, which of course got you banned from Twitter, which is yeah. ridiculous. Um, but having to deal with all that makeup, and she has some quite arduous yes. scenes. Yeah. How was she to work with? This is Sylvia. So the first time I met Laura, it was for a different project, and she got attacked by a swarm of flying ants. But she's Laura Van Vervoort, so she's professional, she's cool, and she was just fighting them off, and she kept talking until one moment. She was like, sorry, I'm being attacked by ants. And I was like, you know, I'm remaking a Cronenberg movie. I don't know if he'd be interested. And we actually offered her Chelsea originally, and she's like, I don't want to play Chelsea. I want to play Rose. And I was like, you want to play Rose? And I was like, all right. That's a, we pulled the offers for everyone else, and I was like, you get to play Rose. And, we ta and uh, I remember our very first meeting after everything was done, and she looks at me, and she's like, you know, I don't really know you guys so well, and I've already agreed to do this movie, and uh, <laughs> but we're just going for dinner right now, and it's just it's just kind of a, a thing. And I was like, yeah, we don't really know each other. We're really going to get to know each other on this. And she was so brave. Her first day, she couldn't talk. We had it was a completely silent day, uh, and she thought it was so ch so cool. I mean, um, when you lose something like that, like uh, the ability to use your mouth, but for Laura. People get so caught up on what she looks like, her physical appearance, that nobody even realizes she's an actress. I actually think with the prosthetics, it's the most beautiful look she does in the whole thing because, well, um, my cat, who, who recently died, uh, he had a, a huge battle with cancer. And during it, uh, he had to have a partial mandibulectomy where part of his jaw was removed. And uh, he didn't lose much of his looks, but it was, it was still something to get used to. Jen taught him how to drink again. Um, the slurry scene where she's drinking, that was, that was him. That was every, every piece of him. And uh, Laura knew we were going through that too. And she, uh, she brought so much heart to it, you know, like real, real heart. And uh, 
she at first, because because of uh, growing up in in the limelight, she w didn't feel comfortable about people comparing her to Marilyn Chambers. And we talked a lot about Marilyn, Marilyn's actual effect on the world, and how she was a feminist, and how she was fighting always for equal rights. And uh, Laura would watch. Marilyn before we did a scene to emulate Marilyn and she's like I wouldn't do it exactly like this but Marilyn did it so she would do that and there were scenes where I was like you look you look exactly like her right now you you're exactly Marilyn and she was so happy about it I mean there's moments where I was like Laura's a black belt I wish she could do something else but you're limited within the same thing mostly Rose is crying or hurting on the floor or hitchhiking in the original one we didn't hitchhike because oh my god and we couldn't go to the roads we had had to stay self-contained somehow but uh, I always told uh, Laura that this is probably the hardest movie she'll ever do and she'll never have to do something like this again because like Marvel or fucking DC is going to scoop her up and I'm going to be like, Laura, we have another horror movie. And she's like, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm just like, you know, in Tibet saving the world. I'm like, okay, girl, you do your thing. This is Jen. I really pride ourselves on being able to get career best performances from actors. I honestly don't know if other directors really do their jobs because a lot of them talk to their crew and they don't have an open communication communication with their actors. Even if you go over to your actor and you have no notes and you're like, that's fantastic, I'm very happy with what you're doing. That's all you need to do. And when there's two directors like us, I and Sylvia always make sure that one of us is with the cast, that we speak extensively with them about what they're going to do and what they're, what's going on in their head. I think the reason that Laura hasn't been allowed to perform better because as you can see she's a phenomenal actress it is because she's so beautiful and traditionally she works with male directors I think she's only worked with one female director and for whatever reason I think there is maybe an attraction issue or I don't want to upset the beautiful actress or I don't even know how to talk to a woman kind of issue because I asked her how do you, how do you usually work and she's like no one ever talks to me this much I'm like wow, I wonder what directors do with you, because, and she's like, yeah, well, sometimes I just don't know what I'm doing, and it's like, well, yeah, I, I've watched other things, and I'm like, hmm, I wonder if they told Laura, do this or do that, and I'm like, no, I, I asked her, they didn't, and that's why you have those challenges. I also feel that happens with really famous actors, like Ryan Reynolds, you know, there's some actors that are so famous, I don't think directors even bother talking to them, like, oh, he's going to do whatever he's going to do. This is Sylvia, so Jen, you're basically fearless to talk to everyone and tell them they need to do better work. And this is Jen. <laughs> yeah, don't you want to talk to your director? I mean, I'm on, I am only here to make actors look good. I make the cast look good, and I make everything look good. And that's, I just, you know, to direct is to just tweak it in a different direction. I really commend uh, Laura for doing the film because she's never done anything so bizarre and she didn't really know us very well. And she doesn't, didn't really have a knowledge of Cronenberg before. And we're like, listen, for Canada, we're all doing this. This is a patriotic pride moment. <laughs> this is Sylvia. And uh, she actually t put on a producer's hat as well. Um, she got Greg Brick for the great Me Too scene that's in the soap opera, which is one of my favorite scenes in the whole movie. Sadly, I had to cut it down for 13 minutes because people were like, Sylvia, you have to get out of that scene. I was like, I could live there forever. <laughs> This is Jen. Wait till the half an hour version is released. The entire movie is just that scene. <laughs> it's such a good scene for me because uh, in the original, the outbreak was the STD crisis. And right now, what I feel is the outbreak is there's an attack on our minds. And most of us are losing. And we've been turned into poisoning our thoughts. If your thoughts and your words match and then your actions match, it all originates in your mind. And it takes three positive thoughts to combat one negative thought. And it actually starts to rewire your brain. In America, I've noticed there's a huge fucking difference between American media and international, like European media, even from being here just a few days. In America, you're told to be angry, you're told to pick a side, and the other side is your enemy, and get angry. Get so angry that you can kill that person. Justify punching them. Call them a Nazi, call them an extreme leftist, and incite violence, because you're so right. I can't believe how violent our country has gotten. That's why this was set in America instead of Canada. The original was in Montreal, and we like to joke that if that happened in Montreal, it would be like Breaking Bad. Oh, you have cancer, chemo starts next Tuesday, you know? Open, shut, <laughs> case. In America, I mean, you watch 
people have their teeth rot out because they just can't afford basic human care. Yeah. And then you watch other people living in absolute luxury, pumping their faces full of sheep fat to try and look normal. It's absolutely ridiculous. And it's also what we did in Rabbit is if you listen to the conversations happening, it's always very aggressive, always very mean because it's always just at that breaking point. I wanted people to watch this movie and get so frustrated with how things are that they're motivated to go out and change. Yeah.